I retired uh, two years ago, almost three years ago from the classroom, but since that time, I have not had time to miss the, I miss the students, I, I really miss working with the students, but I haven't really had time to miss teaching yet because I've been so busy writing. I've been on, as Pastor mentioned, I've been on uh, retiree sabbaticals, as they call them. Sabbatical means rest. So I don't know why you have to work so hard in a sabbatical, but every waking moment I find myself writing uh, textbooks for the seminary and the college. So that has been a blessing to be able to finally have blocks of time. My life is a block of time now to, to focus on some things that I've always really wanted to, uh, to pursue in full, ideas and concepts and and histories of various people and places and, and, and churches. So what a blessing. Uh, I will be 69 years old in three weeks. So uh, you, you didn't, uh, you thought I was much older than that, didn't you? Mm -hmm. My wife looks young, but, uh, but I'm getting old. Still have my hair, but... Uh, Thank you for the emphasis today that has been in the program. Thank you, Brooke. Thank you, Pastor, for uh, illuminating us with some things. I didn't know about the Baptist hymn writers. That was, I was sitting there writing things down that he was saying. And uh, good stuff. Thank you very much for, for that. The pilgrims, I left off in the, the Sunday school hour with the pilgrims, they were still in Amsterdam, or they were still in England, rather, and uh, they escape because of persecution. They're separatist believers, and uh, the Baptists, my, my theme is Baptist, the, the Baptist history does touch on the history of the Mayflower pilgrims. And the map that you see in front of you uh, starts up with the little town of Scrooby, and the arrow goes down to Boston. I know you can't, I, I would assume you couldn't see those small words on the screen. But it was in 1607, they decided to uh, leave the country clandestinely. They must leave uh, in the quiet of the night. They must leave in secret. They hope that no one will turn them in when uh, onlookers, when residents see this many people traveling together towards the ocean towards the North Sea. So they finally come to Boston and they have hired an English sea captain to have his ship waiting there in the wash, uh, the little tributary there leading into the North Sea and they would cross the North Sea into, into Holland. However, when they arrived, the sea captain had them board the ship, collecting their very expensive fees for the journey, not very far across the North Sea. They usually make it uh, in less than a day. But once they were all on board and the captain had them in the confinement of his ship, he turned them over to the officers of the English government who mistreated them, who while they were still thanking the Lord for his blessings upon them, the king's officer suddenly appeared, ar arrested them all, and the captain had betrayed them, had swindled them out of mercy, uh, and without mercy, he, they searched their clothing the officers indecently searched the clothing of men and women and boys and girls and took them back into Boston and imprisoned them. There was not enough space in the prisons, in the cells to put them all. And so they ended up keeping just the leaders, the men leaders in the cells for several months. And there is no history of what happened to the rest of the pilgrims during this time. We know that they uh, were all reassembled later. But uh, the next year, they tried again. There's a, 
if, if you go to the, uh, this is what I just told you that you're reading on the screen here, ransacked their luggage and plundered their books, even rifled through their books looking for cash. And uh, so in Boston, the, the building that was the prison at that time is still standing there. You can still visit this. It's, it is a pilgrim museum today. And uh, even here, the courtroom where they were tried uh, is still there. And in the middle of the courtroom, there's a stairs going right in the middle there. You can't really, you probably can't see from where you're sitting, but it, it, the steps just go right down into the, into the jail area. And you can still visit the cells where they were incarcerated. We're talking about men like uh, John Robinson and William Bradford and William Brewster and Richard Clifton and all these familiar names in uh, Mayflower Pilgrim history. So it's still there. The next year, 1608, they tried again. They all got back together. They had sold all their belongings, so no one knows where they spent that winter. But they tried again. This time, uh, all the women and children got on uh, barges with their furnishings that they were taking to Holland with them. And most of the children, women, a few men went on the barges, but most of the men and, and boys uh, walked by land, so they couldn't, so they were separated, because that many people, about 125 people traveling together, they would be turned into the law before they would ever get up to Hull or Immingham, where a Dutch ship was waiting. They had contracted a Dutch uh, sea captain, and uh, so what happens is that the, the women and children the, and the girls and many of the boys uh, taking little trib river tributaries up one flowing into another all the way up to Hull. It's, it's on the map today, it's Hull. And they arrived there before the men and the boys arrived by foot. And a storm came up. And the barges were rocking and uh, babies were crying. And the ladies uh, asked the barge attendants to put the barges in a little tributary here and, and let's wait for the storm to pass. The winds were blowing, the tide was uh, coming in, and let's just wait for the men and, and, and our boys to, to arrive. Meanwhile, the ship's cap captain is there, the ship is waiting, and uh, suddenly the men appear, and uh, at that point, the tide was still too low, and the barges had sunk into the mud. And that's where they stayed. They had to wait for the tide to, to, to float the barges again. So the Dutch sea captain was getting a little nervous because he was taking people secretly out of England. He wanted no problem with the English government. It was against the law for the Mayflower pilgrims to stay because, and worship according to the dictates of their own conscience, according to the word of God. And it was against the law for them to leave without a permit. So they were leaving, it's better to obey God than man. So they, the only way they could worship God was to leave. And if they had uh, applied for a permit, they would have just been arrested again. So they left because it's better to obey man than God. They tried to leave and finally they did. But suddenly the sea captain saw a band of English officers coming towards the barges, some by horse, some by foot, armed, and the sea captain panicked, and he told his men to, to, to raise the anchor, hoist the sails, let's leave. By this time, though, he already had all the men and boys, the boys who were with the men, on the ship. So here are, are the men and many of the boys leaving the women and little girls and some of the boys stuck in the mud facing armed soldiers who were their enemies. And the captain is waving goodbye. You know, he's out. And the storm, usually it, it would take a ship less, less than a day to, to cross the sea. It took them two weeks to cross the sea. They didn't know what was happening back uh, with the women and children because they, the wind blew them almost to Norway. To we're talking about right here is where the hull that's where the, they were, and the, the, the winds blew them all almost up to Norway. 
And finally, when the storm went away, they, they, they got down to uh, Amsterdam here. And Bradford tells the story in his Mayflower uh, Plymouth Plantation. By the way, we wouldn't know the name of the ship were it not for Bradford's history. But he tells us that now this was in the spring. By the end of the summer, he said all of the pilgrims were in Holland. We, we didn't lose anyone. The officers had taken the, the women before magistrate after magistrate. They didn't know what to do with them. There wasn't enough jail space. And so finally, someone probably told them, just leave the best way you can. So no one knows. That they came in separate contingents, a few here and a few on this ship, a few on that ship. And by the end of the summer, he said, we were all in Holland. Praise the Lord. And, and typical of William Bradford's uh, historical method was another great providence of God. That's the way he ended that statement. Another great providence of God. These people love God. These people worship the Lord. They were separatists. They were Bible believers. They were everything uh, that, that a Christian could be back in those days. So they're in Holland. And those mothers were looking, as they had been standing there in the on the barges, looking tearfully into the faces of terrified children, pulling at their clothing. And, you know, we talk about the pilgrim fathers, the great pilgrim fathers. What about pilgrim mothers and the pilgrim children? They suffered a great deal too, didn't they? And so they, at that creek today, there's a monument erected to, in memory of, of those people who left under such conditions. It's hard to find that monument, so if you ever go looking for it, let me know and I'll show you how to find it. I'll, I'll send you an email. So they crossed over. I, I used to give uh, Mayflower tours in England and Holland, just tracing. My wife and I went over, first of all, and just drove it, just finding every place and mapping out a, a, a tour plan. So, so we, when we took tour groups, we would, we would cross the North Sea just where they crossed it. And I was looking back in this picture to where the pilgrims departed, where we had departed too. And there are plants, there's smoke coming out of smokestacks, a, a very industrial section of England today. So they come to Amsterdam and, and they begin worshiping uh, for a short time again with John Smith, who had been their pastor in Gainsborough. And uh, so they... Smith soon separates from them, and I told you a little of his story. He became an Anabaptist, and uh, one of his group, Thomas Hellwise, and eight or ten other people separated from Smith, came back to England in the face of persecution and established in the Spitalfield section of London the First Baptist Church on English, on English soil. So uh, you remember Gainsborough. We talked about Smith pastoring there. So uh, this is kind of a recap on the screen here of, of what we've done so far in, in Baptist history and with this strand of Baptist at least. Now Thomas Hellweiss was a general Baptist, unlimited atonement. He, he, was, uh, he was a very good man. He, he wrote a number of works uh, appealing to the government of England to stop persecuting God's people. Some classic works uh, of freedom of religion came out of the early Baptist writings. The best works you could read in English on religious freedom came from these early men who were persecuted by the government. Now John Smith, by the way, who was not a Baptist, never had been a Baptist, who became an independent Anabaptist and his church eventually was accepted by the Anabaptists. And I, that's again from Sunday school hour. John Smith wrote a 20 article confession of faith that he had a that he had sent over to the Mennonites asking, asking if, if they would accept that because he had read their confession of faith. He knew what they believed. So he sent this one along to them. It's very anti-Calvinistic, of course. It's against infant baptism, which is good, but it's also Pelagian in doctrine, which is a heresy. And Pelagianism is a doctrine that teaches that uh, babies are born pure. There is no imputation of Adam's sin that all babies, every baby is born as pure as Adam was before the fall. And that the only reason that babies become sinners or young children become sinners is just uh, imitating their parents and other people. 
So that is a heresy because we're born under sin, we're born under guilt, and we're, we're born dead spiritually. So let's come to the Baptist, uh, some of the Baptist confessions of faith. The Declaration of Faith in 1611, which was written by Thomas Helweis, who was a real Baptist, the first pastor of a Baptist church of English-speaking people, wrote a confession of faith. So we, we, can, we can label this as the first Baptist confession of faith. It was written for the purpose of, and I, I tell this sometimes to the landmark people who have their successionism view, that the first Baptist church was started and their confession written in order to distinguish them from those Anabaptists and from those heresies. And now what does a landmark Baptist do with this? Ignore it. <laughs> That's, every time I have brought it up to somebody, just ignore it. Just skip that point. You know, and again, as I said earlier, I know some of you came uh, for this hour. You were not here for the last hour. But uh, most of the landmark Baptists that I know are godly people. They're wrong on their view of Baptist beginnings. That doesn't make them bad people. Because I, I, I know uh, J.M. Carroll, for example, who wrote Trail of Blood. I, I, I vehemently disagree with Trail of Blood. But personally, he was a godly man. If he were here today, we could, we could break bread together. If he would let me. <laughs> but I, I know that from our point of view, we can. So it teaches Arminianism, but not Pelagianism. These early Baptists, these, these early general Baptists. It denies landmarkism or successionism. Now John Smith had taught successionism. The reason, one of the, one of the reasons that he wanted to join the Mennonites and the Anabaptists was to tag on to a long succession of truth. So he was a landmarker. And at the end of his life, he wrote a book called Retractions in which he disowned that view. He said, I, I take it back, I'm not, a, I'm, I'm not a successionist. But Hellweiss broke away, and that was one of the reasons that Hellweiss broke away from him. Not only was he a Pelagian, he was teaching something that was historically erroneous. This confession of faith uh, acknowledges the invisible universal church, the one body of Christ. It emphasizes the local church. No early Baptist confession denies the existence of the one body, the one church of Ephesians 5.25. And, and these Baptist confessions urge the independence of the local church, the autonomy, the self-government of the local church. We do, not have a, uh, we do not have to look to Rome or any other headquarters for all the local churches. This is governed by, under the administration of the Holy Spirit, governed by the congregation of baptized believers who break bread together. There's another creed, I'm not mentioning all of their creeds, just some, some of the major ones. It was called the Orthodox Creed. Uh, again, General Baptist Creed, written in 1678. And on the title page, it says that, that this is a Protestant confession of faith. Now, I know landmark Baptist, the landmark Baptist position is that Baptists were not Protestants because Protestants came out of the Roman Catholic Church. Baptists never came out of the Roman Catholic Church. Well, if you look at the history of the Anabaptists of the 16th and 17th centuries, virtually every one of the leaders of the Anabaptists I'm talking about in Zwingli's day, when Anabaptist leaders such as Felix Mons and Conrad Grable and of all thousands of Hugh Meyer, they, they had all been Roman Catholic priests. You look at it. And they had left Rome and become Protestants, reformers. And when they saw that the Reformation was not really going very far, very fast, they left Protestantism, they left the reformers and became separatists, became Baptists. 
But don't say that Baptists didn't come out of all of that because, because they really did. And if you, if you want to tie Baptists with Anabaptists, what are you going to do about the fact that the Anabaptists had been, had been Romanists? So you see, landmarkism has all kinds of problems historically that they really can't answer. But, but you look at that. This confession is to unite and confirm all true Protestants in the fundamental articles of the Christian religion against the errors and heresies of Rome. I like that. That sounds good to me. But this uh, Orthodox confession was the major and most complete of all general Baptist confessions. It's Arminian, but uh, on the major cardinal doctrines, they're right. In fact, it's remarkably Calvinistic. So when I say that, that the general Baptists were Arminian, uh, if they heard me say that, some of them, they would say, we're not Arminian. Many of them were not Arminian, but they were general Baptists. So I, I'm saying this because most Baptist history textbooks will tell you that all the general Baptists were Arminians, when they really were not. And not all the particular Baptists were diehard, rigid, five-point Calvinist either. There's a wonderful balance in when they became Baptists. They, I, I think because the Baptists were a people of the book, of God's book, there was a balance there. And they avoided extremes. If God's word says whosoever will, we preach it. If God's word says elect before the foundation of the world, preach it. We believe it. God's truth is one, though it has many, it has many sides. And, and we're like the little ant approaching the boulder of truth. And we can only see one piece of it at the time. Truth is God. God is truth. And God is the only one who can logically see all the pieces come together. To God, it is all... Now, we, we look at as seemingly opposing assertions in Scripture. We see the responsibility of man. We see elect before the foundation of the world. And we say, how can you reconcile that? That seems to be contradictory. There, is no, there are no contradictions. Because in God's mind, and God is God, and we can't think the way God does because he's God, and we're just little ants looking at a piece of the truth at the time. It's his truth. And it's his oneness. It's like one truth, many sides. Three in one, one in three. The Trinity itself is one, but it's three. It's three, but it's one. And it's not logical to us, but to God it is. And there are some things that we will never be able to grasp fully because we're humans. We're finite. So we leave it to God, and we preach whosoever will, and we preach elect. And let just, you know, we don't have to apologize. We don't have to try to say, well, you know, this, I don't know what to do with this. No, this, God has already done it. He has revealed it to you. Preach it. So <laughs> it's fun to be a Baptist, I'll tell you what. It prescribes immer the immersion of believers. This uh, Orthodox confession, remember this is 1678. The particular Baptist when they began in London, I'll be covering this in a few moments, but when they began in 1638 under John Spilsbury, they discovered from the Bible immersion in 1641. And when they did that and wrote the first London Confession of Faith, from that time on, every Baptist is an immersionist. You can't be a Baptist without believing in the immersion of believers. In the early churches, in the first uh, several hundred centuries, the mode of baptism was always immersion. You don't find pouring and sprinkling. You find immersion. Not only immersion, but triple immersion. You baptize them in the name of the Father, and then you baptize them again in the name of the Son. And then you immerse them a third time in the name of the Holy Spirit. That was the early way of doing it. That's the way William Carey did it as well. So this is a Baptist distinctive, which is absolutely irrefutably scriptural. This acknowledges, again, visible churches, local visible churches, as well as the one Catholic universal, small c, universal Catholic uh, church in the scriptures. 
Let's talk about the particular Baptists because uh, we as Baptists today, our lineage really comes from the particular Baptist. For the most part, this is true. Now, there are good Bible-believing, fundamental, free will Baptists who would trace the, their history back to the general Baptist. But most Baptist churches that are not free will Baptist churches by label uh, come from this lineage. So limited atonement, but not harping on it to build one great big point out of five, you know. It was John Spilsbury, I mentioned his name a moment ago, who in London was a Puritan, and there was a church in London that today we call the JLJ Church. Called that because of the names, the last names of the first three pastors. J for Henry Jacob, JL, L for Lathrop, John Lathrop, J, second J for Jesse, John uh, uh, Jesse. So those three pastors of a Puritan church that became separate. They became a separate church, so they were no longer Puritan except in doctrine. So the JLJ, separate, Calvinistic, separate church in London, there emerged from that JLJ church a man named John Spilsbury, and he started studying the scriptures about baptism. And he couldn't get away from the truth of immersion because of what the word means. And sometimes baptizo can mean something else, but whenever it's talking about the ordinance of baptism, it always is immersion. And he couldn't get away from that. And so he became a Baptist and he departed from the JLJ church and established in London on the south bank of the River Thames, the first particular Baptist church. And Spilsbury wrote a book, a treatise on baptism, a great, it's a great work. I, don't, uh, I haven't seen it in print in a long time. So the 1638, there is an old manuscript written by um, Benjamin Keach that looks like it, that the eight might be a three. So some historians will give both dates, 1638, possibly 1633, when, when the Baptists came out of the JLJ Puritan Church and became Baptist. Uh, I just mentioned Benjamin Keach as one of those early uh, particular Baptist churches or pastors in London. Benjamin Keach pastored the church that Spurgeon would much later pastor. And some of the long line of, uh, of churches going back to that time. And these are just, just three. Keach and John Gill that uh, Pastor Pritt mentioned earlier. John Gill, whose successor was... If I were you, I probably wouldn't remember it either. I'm just... I'm just picking on you there. John Fawcett, you remember John Fawcett who wrote Blessed Be the Tie That Binds. We read that. He was, he was John Gill's successor. And uh, John Rippon, John Rippon was a hymn writer. And uh, eventually Charles Spurgeon. And there were a number of other pastors along between us, the lines here. But I just mentioned a few of the, just a few of the greatest ones. Here, here are some others who were particular Baptists. Roger Williams and John Clark, who founded the first Baptist churches in this country. And we'll say more about them later. Uh, John Miles, who founded the uh, first Welsh Baptist church in Swansea, Massachusetts. That church still exists today. Henry Dunster, who was the first president of Harvard University. And he suddenly in 1654, he, he had become... Uh, president when it was founded back in 1636, but in, by 1654 he decided he was going to be a Baptist because the only qualified person for immersion are believers. And so they ousted him from the presidency, and so he uh, started speaking in local Baptist churches and helping to found uh, many of the, or several, 
of the Baptist churches in colonial New England. Let's go back to the confessions for just a moment. The first London Confession, 1644, it has immersion in it. The title page, interesting, the title page of the 1644 Confession of Faith by Baptists, the Confession of Faith of those, and I'm quoting from the title page, those churches which are commonly, though falsely, called Anabaptists. So the first particular Baptist confession says that our, one of the reasons for our existence is to separate ourselves from Anabaptists. Now, how does a landmark Baptist answer that? He can't. The, the twofold purpose of that confession was to combat general accusations that all Baptists were Arminians or Pelagians and to distinguish particular Baptists from both Anabaptists and General Baptists. So it's very clear. And the model for the first London Confession was the Westminster Confession. That's where they're getting their Reformed theology and Calvinism and all of that. But also getting the great cardinal doctrines of the Trinity and Christology and the church, except immersion. When the Bap what the Baptists had to do, the Baptists took the great Westminster Confession and uh, immersed it and came out and said, oh, okay, now we can handle this. So that's what they did. Not really. I'm just being a little facetious there. But they had to get immersion. The, the Westminster Confession was a Presbyterian document, and they believed in baptizing babies. And the Baptists couldn't, they, they disagreed with that. So this was the first Baptist confession to specify immersion. I'm, I'm still talking about the first London confession by the Baptists. Dipping the whole body under the waters, the way it is worded. They acknowledge both the visible and invisible concepts of the church in the New Testament. You know, Spilsbury's church is still in London. I do not know how faithful they are today with the scriptures. I do not know that because I've never been able to talk with any of the people there, but they, they have a, they, their organization goes all the way back to Spilsbury. But, and it's, today it's located on the north bank of the river, Thames. I mentioned Dunster a moment ago. Let me uh, show you just a little more of that. There in Cambridge, Massachusetts, just across the river, uh, Charles River, from uh, Boston, founded by the Puritans, and um, today about as liberal as, and radical as you could find. But if you go through the Johnston Gate that you're looking at, let's go through the Johnston Gate that leads into Harvard, uh, that's uh, University Dormitory, Massachusetts Hall, Harvard Hall, and you keep walking, you get to uh, uh, Harvard Yard and the law school and all of that. But go through that gate. But before you go through that gate, look over to the left. And on the brick wall, you'll see a plaque embedded into the brick wall there. And it reads, and this is a quotation from the Puritans who established Harvard. After God had carried us safe to New England and we had built our houses provided necessaries for our livelihood, reared convenient places for God's worship. Notice the pattern of priority. Home, church, government. One of the next things we longed for and looked after was to advance learning. That's part of the, the church and the education to provide learning and perpetuate it to posterity, dreading to leave an illiterate ministry. To the churches, when our present ministers shall lie in the dust. That's why Harvard was founded. Dunster became a Baptist, and so he, he was ousted from the position. And... Um, 
if you walk through the gate, you see the, the uh, statue of John Harvard, who was, who, whose name was given to the school. The seal, the official seal of Harvard is veritas, which is the Latin word for truth. Too bad because the truth of God has been forsaken long ago. In modern times, Harvard realized that Henry Dunster had really been one of, and perhaps the greatest president Harvard has ever had. Because for those well over a decade, that a number of years that he was president, he established the spiritual and academic standards in order to be admitted into Harvard in Dunster's day you had to be able to translate from Latin into English <laughs> rather than English into Latin. You had, you had to know Latin so well you could translate it back into English. You had to be able to decline the Greek. You had to be ready to, to learn Hebrew immediately. So quite, he, and he was a godly man and the students loved him. Now let's come to uh, Thomas Gould. What I'm going to do now is give you a, a quick... Uh, a, a quick uh, tour through New England and the Middle States and just show you, someone asked me uh, after Sunday school today the question, well, what are some of the important churches that we could go to just to learn more about Colonial Baptist Church history? And I said, well, I'm glad you asked because I'm, I'm going to do that this morning. So I want to take the next few moments to, uh, to do that, next few minutes. Thomas Gould founded the First Baptist Church in Boston in 1665. And in the first entry of the record book, which was started when the church was started, it says that this church, commonly though falsely called Anabaptist, there we go again, is gathered together and entered into fellowship and communion. So again, they want to distinguish themselves as Baptists rather than Anabaptists. What would a landmark adherent do with that? There's nothing you could say. That's what the church looks like today. They, they built that in the 1800s. It's a liberal church today. Let's go to Rhode Island. Let's go to Providence. And we will, as you can see, the small picture there is First Baptist Church. Roger Williams established that church in 1639. Roger Williams, you see him holding the book with that statue. And the book is actually the Bible, but on the front of it, it says Soul Liberty. S-O-U-L Liberty. That means a priesthood of every believer. That means that the local church is not under a hierarchy. It is under God. It is not under a human machination. And thank God for these early Baptists who preached that message that was so needed and is so needed today because our country has lost it. All of those things which the Baptists fought for, wrote for, shed their blood for, we're losing it today. including slowly, a piece at the time, a little bit at the time, the constitutional right to bear arms, the separation of church and state, these things, not so slowly anymore, it seems like so quickly now, slipping away from us. And most of our country today is uninformed. They are people who do not want to do what I'm doing. They do not want to hear it. it, it and people today cannot listen to this. Too much information. This is not an information society today. This is a hands-on, cliche kind of population today. And they do not want to hear the facts. And that's why we have Baptist history seminars to get ourselves inspired to go back and to find out what we, we were given all of these blessings and liberties because people had to fight for it. And now we're sitting back on our hands, letting people take it away from us. 
thank God for Roger Williams. Now, I, someone might, if you know a little bit ahead of me here, he, he didn't stay with the Baptist church but about four months. But the reason for that, he, he never broke with the Baptist, but he stopped being pastor because he wanted to be a missionary to the Indians. He was a great missionary to the, the Indians, translating scr uh, scripture into the, Eng into the Indian tongue, living in their smoky, smelly holes, I'm quoting his words, in order to learn their tongue, in order to gain their souls, and he, he, he was a great man. He was a great man. He was also a premillennialist. And he, Roger Williams has a bad press today. I, I can usually go into a class of Baptist history and assume that if anyone in that class has heard anything about Roger Williams, it was bad. So we're supposed to dislike him. Try reading his seven volumes. And if, if you're sensitive to the things of the Lord, uh, you, you're going to come away with Roger Williams being your friend. Just try reading him sometimes rather than what his, peop, his enemies say about him. In that same church, First Baptist Church of Providence, the second great awakening in America, the great revival, the great awakening was started under Dr. James Manning, who was a Princeton graduate who was a particular Baptist who wore a clerical collar. Very sophisticated, very, very uh, professional man. Uh, wore a wig, a big wig, like the Puritans would have done in the pulpit. But he was preaching through a series of sermons on justification by faith. And in the midst of that series of sermons that he was preaching starting in 1774 and it went over into the next year for a few Sundays, the, the great awakening broke out. When people started getting saved, this church had not seen souls saved ever as for anything significant. Now people were in the community, people were coming to the house of God because they had heard what God was doing. This place was an exciting church, and God was working. There was a black man who, who, stepped, who everyone knew who Bigelow was. It was a black man. He, he worked for everyone, and everyone was his friend. And, and one, day, one day he stepped off the curbing, if I may call a dirt street, uh, and, and a Horse and buggy ran right over him, couldn't stop, and killed Bigelow. Bigelow was lying there dead, and it just gripped the consciousness. It, it gripped the, the awakening. Everyone, this is why I call it a great awakening. Everyone was suddenly awakened to the truth of, of life and death and eternity and the gospel. So the church was flooded with people, and they didn't have this great big church. They built this great big church because of that during James Manning's time. They, their little building couldn't accommodate it. So they built this building, which is still standing there today, because of the awakening. I wish I had time to, you know, go more into that. But uh, that, this is Baptist history. And this is something we need to get back to. So the plaque at the front door commemorating Roger Williams, 1638-1639. But that's one of the great colonial Baptist meeting, meeting houses. Uh, it was, it was Pastor Dr. James Manning who founded Brown University. That's what you're looking at here. Brown University was the first higher Baptist higher institution of learning in this country. Today it's radical. But, but it was a Baptist school back in those days. It trained many famous Baptist preachers. Come down to Newport, Rhode Island. You come into Newport... You see the white steeple? There, maybe you can, maybe you can't. John Clark, John Clark founded the church here in 16, probably about 1638. About the same time Roger Williams was founding the, the one in Providence. It was in Newport, it was not called a Baptist church until about 1644. But it was started in 38 probably. So by 1644 it was Baptist. Before that time it was probably just congregational. But by 44, 1644, Baptist. 
Dr. John Clark, he was a medical doctor. By the way, John Smith was a medical doctor too. One day in 1651, Dr. Clark, pastor, with two elders, we would call them deacons, were visiting a sick brother who lived in Lynn, Massachusetts. Now, it was against the law to be a Baptist in Massachusetts at that time. They went over to visit this sick brother, brother and, and Clark was sharing a devotion to encourage the, the brother who was sick. He, he was, uh, call it preaching, whatever, but he was sharing Revelation 3, verses 8 through 11, which is the church at Smyrna of the seven churches of Revelation. Suddenly, the doors burst open. Soldiers came in and arrested the four men for holding an illegal church service in the colony of Massachusetts. Obadiah Holmes was, was the assistant pastor there with, with Dr. Clark. Holmes was beaten with 30 stripes. They were taken into Boston and beaten with a three-corded whip, 30 stripes. John Clark went to, went to England to, to re get the charter for the colony of Rhode Island. And while he was there, he wrote an anonymous work called Ill News from New England, which is a beautiful book to read. It's still, you can get that book. You, it's in print, been reprinted. Ill News from New England, in which he writes in part. He's talking about their being arrested, taken to Boston, beaten, fined. In our examination, the governor of Massachusetts upbraided us with the name of Anabaptist, to whom I answered, I disowned the name. I am neither an Anabaptist nor a pedo-baptist. Pedo-baptist, pedo means child. A pediatrician, okay, pedo means child. And a Baptist, a pedo Baptist is a baby baptizer. I'm not an Anabaptist and I'm not a baby baptizer. I'm a Baptist. And uh, that church today in Newport is called the United Baptist Church. I do not know how faithful they are to preaching because it's part of the association up there. So I know they've been very kind to me. They have a little museum there, and it's nice, a wonderful place to visit. And so is the church in Providence. The church in Providence is liberal today. This church in Newport is not as old as the big, beautiful church you saw in Providence. The building isn't as old. The association goes back to 1638. Dr. Clark is buried there in the middle of Newport. And on his tombstone, it says, Dr. John Clark, and it has a great eulogy. When I took that picture, it was Memorial Day. It was pouring down rain, and someone was holding an umbrella over my head. But that's why the flowers were there. Briefly, the second London Confession was an expansion of the first, which had been written in 1644. And this is really the one that we gravitate to today because it was revised and expanded and made into more uh, consistently a Baptist confession of faith. It is the first Baptist confession to use the word infallible to describe the Bible because that was becoming an issue at that time. Charles Spurgeon at the dedication service, it was actually a dedication at the groundbreaking. They had several dedications, but at the brown gr groundbreaking, he placed a copy of this second London Confession along with a copy of the Scripture and along with a copy of John Rippon's hymn book, put it, sealed it into a, a bottle, a big bottle, and corked it, put it under the cornerstone of the Metropolitan Tabernacle. We'll be talking about Spurgeon tonight in more depth. But Charles Spurgeon, pastor of Metropolitan Tabernacle described this confession of faith. This ancient document is the most excellent epitome of the things most surely believed among us. By the preserving hand of the triune Jehovah, we have been kept faithful to the great points of our glorious gospel. I would love to have heard him say that. 
I, I was quoting from his autobiography. Now, Benjamin and Elias Keach condensed the Second London Confession into a shorter version, and at one time it was called the Keach Confession. Benjamin Keach was the father of Elias Keach. Benjamin Keach was one of the greatest pastors in London, Baptist Church. And th so this was essentially incorporated, this confession incorporated into the Philadelphia Confession of Faith for American Baptists in 1742. Let's talk about Elias Keach. And this is, by the way, this is, I think this is probably as far as I'll go today. When I finish Keach, I'll, I'll, I'll be stopping. And we'll resume right there tonight. But Elias Keach came over here to this country on a ship. He just caught a ship, came over. He was an unregenerate young man, college age, had been under some of the greatest preaching in London from his, pa his father. And so what do you do as a young teenage rebel in colonial Philadelphia? You know, what, what's cool? And so one thing he found to do, he, he, somehow he got a clerical gown with a collar. And he put the gown and the collar on, and he stood on a street corner in Philadelphia and started preaching, just for the kick of it. He knew what to say. And one day, a group of Welsh Christians, Bible believers, came by, and they said, young man, we need a pastor. We, uh, and, and the Keeches were Welsh who, who had gone to England. We, we need a pastor over at Pennypack. Have you, how many of you know where Pennypack is? Philadelphia, northern uh, part of Philadelphia, Pennypack. Pennypack Creek, Pennypack Park. Well, they said, young man, we, we have a group. We're meeting in homes over at Pennypack by the Pennypack Creek. And we need a pastor. Would you come and preach for us this coming Lord's Day? And he's, he, what can you say? Uh, okay. So he went over and he preached. And what I'm telling you is actually recorded in Morgan. Morgan Edwards was one of the early Baptist historians. Isaac Bacchus was another one. But Morgan Edwards actually was the pastor of the first Baptist church in Philly. And what I'm telling you is found in the... Uh, he traveled all over the colonies collecting materials that would be towards a history of the Baptist in Pennsylvania. He didn't live long enough to write the history, but he had gathered all the materials for other men like Bacchus to come along and write the history. But I'm, I'm getting this from, uh, from his materials. Elias was standing there at the pulpit. They had a pulpit Bible, and he was preaching from it. The best he knew how was an unregenerate. And suddenly the people looked at the, at, at the young man and his face was twisted and he looked like he was in agony. And, and he was totally silent for a few minutes. And they thought, well, what's wrong with the young man? He, he's, someone needs to help him. And suddenly he, he recollected himself and explained to them, I have a confession to make. I just got saved from my own sermon. Amen. Amen. And so he, he said, where's the Baptist preacher? I need to get immersed. And so they, they found one over at Cold Springs, which is uh, over, over near Bristol. Uh, over here, there's Pennypack Park and Bristol right up there. In, in the top right-hand corner. They went over, they found, they found a preacher over there uh, who was pastoring a church. The church didn't last that long. It finally went out of existence. So Elias went over, he immersed him in the Delaware River, went back to Penny Park, and became the founding pastor of their organized church. So the Penny Pack Park Baptist Church is the oldest Baptist church in the state of Pennsylvania. And, and it's still over there. That's Delaware River. But you go back to Penny Pack, there's a sign out in front. It was established in 1688, Pennypack Baptist Church. 
their building doesn't go back to 1688, but it is, it, it is colonial. Looks like that. And the congregation has a new modern building that they have regular services in, but they have special uh, Easter sunrise services, things like that in the old building. They're liberal, so, you know, if when you talk with them, you know, give them the gospel. I like to go to places like this. Give the gospel. Tell them the real heritage here. And tell them how they have abandoned it. But here's a man. I, I, I've been inside. Usually we have to open up the shutters, get some light in there so you can take good pictures. And uh, there's the interior. And there I can see Elias Keach right now. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth, as the Apostle Paul wrote to the church at Rome. In Romans chapter 10, beginning in verse 9, if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Thou shalt be saved. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, for with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. And when God works in the heart, the mouth can't be quiet. The first thing I know when, when I was converted, the first thing I had to say, I have to tell someone about this. I have something to say. And, and I, I, have, I, I had always been a very quiet kid. You know, I was quiet when everyone else, even among the bad kids, uh, I was a quiet bad kid. You know, I didn't, never had much to say. When people came to our home, never had much to say. But I was just quiet. And when God saved me, he put a message in my heart and in my brain. And I can't be quiet about it. Praise God for salvation. Praise God for the indwelling Holy Spirit. Praise God for the gospel of Jesus Christ. Praise God for a risen Savior. 